is really wonderful when a group of people, no matter what color, no matter what religious belief, they sit at the table and they break bread together. All the years I've been here, this is the driest I've seen the Little Bighorn River. This is how we dive in. We, we weren't allowed to speak crow, and we were punished for it. We work with Hope of Mountain on the Storytellers program to make sure that all of the children who come into the Livingston Food Pantry have books to read. We had Crow women talk to other Crow women, and with that success, we decided we needed to become a nonprofit. Today, everybody has lost their language. They don't have, they can't say it's our first language anymore. They have to learn it today. You do not have to have permission to speak your language. And you don't have to have permission to teach your language. You just have to do it. You know, in the United States, there's enormous disparities. There's communities that have an abundance of resources, and there's communities that have fewer. And one of the commitments we've made is to invest in rural and tribal nations that are working collectively as citizens to create something better. Hope a Mountain really provides knowledge and resources for community leaders who already have great ideas and a great sense of how to come together and solve, uh, solve problems, but they don't know exactly how to set up an organization or they may not know in some cases how to apply for college. They don't know, they don't quite know the process involved for how to set up a nonprofit, for example. Hope a Mountain knows these things and can bring community leaders together who can support each other and help each other grow in that process. You see? That's a root. Mm -hmm. Here they go. So when you go out to communities, you know who the citizen leaders are very quickly. They tend to be involved in lots of initiatives. People reference their name time and time again when you ask who's involved in youth projects, who's involved working with the elderly, who's involved in working with transportation or healthcare. By investing in rural communities and native nations, we're supporting local sovereignty. We're supporting change that's efficient because it's what these communities want for themselves. So this morning we're having our Messengers for Health board retreat. Bonnie has been key. This organization, she kind of gave us the pros and maybe a few cons and just um, just laid everything out and helped us and guided us in the process of the steps that we needed to take to get ourselves established as a nonprofit. This project began as a research project and after addressing that issue and just making a breakthrough and just overcoming cultural barriers and taboos and developing a program that really utilized the strength of the Crow uh, Indian people we had Crow women talk to other Crow women. And with that success, we decided we needed to become a nonprofit. So Messengers for Health is a native nonprofit. We're in our seventh year. So the community really takes the lead. We find citizen leaders in every community. They're people that others turn to when they need help. 
They're the kind of innovative individuals too that see opportunities. They see the opportunity to create new things, to foster community change, to bring others together. They exist in every community. And you know them when you see it. That is called an arepa. It's from South America. I'm from Colombia. No dairy, no animal product at all. Enjoy. There's napkins right there. Claudia Cravat is just an extraordinary woman. She's an expert in pulses, lentils and peas that are grown here in this region. And she's sharing her food knowledge with others helping encourage people to eat proteins that are healthy, helping folks how to live sustainably. One of the initiatives that we're seeing right now here and other places around the region that's so powerful is people coming together to grow local food and build local food economies. Working together, people are creating sustainable food systems. And that's critical to the future and health of this region and our children. One of the things that is really wonderful is when a group of people, no matter what color, no matter what religious belief, no matter what kind of accent they have, they sit at the table and they break bread together. We let go of everything else and we just enjoy what is in our mouth. Perfect and then I'll have some greens. At the Livingston Food Pantry, we provide emergency food support for people who, for any reason, don't have enough food to eat. Okay. All right, let's go. So I'm from Hopa Mountain, and these books are part of our Storymakers program. And so um, the goal for the program is to just give you some books that you can use um, as tools for learning at home with your little ones. Approximately 35 to 40 percent of the families that we help in our food pantry have children living in the household. And it's very important for us to take care of those children, make sure they're eating well, and that they have other support and help that they might need. So we work with Hope of Mountain on the Storytellers program to make sure that all of the children who come into the Livingston Food Pantry have books to read so that their parents can read to them and that the children can become involved with, with reading and with books because it's so important long term for their education and, and ultimately I think for their health and well-being. And a strawberry? And an orange? Oh, good job. You do so good. I usually try to read to him before bed or um, like during the day when he starts getting cranky or something, just laying him in my lap and reading to him. James, Hi. do you want to look at it too, Sophia? I know you're little, but you can still look at it. Did you read from him all from the very, very start? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's relaxing, isn't it? It is, especially when 
you're sick from being pregnant with another one. It's very oh relaxing gosh, to. I bet. One sunny morning, the warm sun came up and pop. Out of the egg came a tiny, very hungry caterpillar. Are you going to be a hungry caterpillar? <laughs> so you're doing so many of the things that we encourage families to do, just talking throughout the day, asking lots of questions. You can always call or visit our website for more information, more um, early childhood resource materials, information about brain development and everything like that. Yeah. Check this out. Well, now, where are we going to find this now? Let's check it out. Which one? Do we have to keep turning pages to find this? Here, you try one. Here, you, you find it, okay? And then we can read it. Oh, this looks like a one at a time, I think. Oh, they're thick, aren't they? Oh, now check that out. Where do you think that lives? That lives in the south of the United States. Where is the south? Right there. See that? And strike when it's ready. Tell me what these are. Name this one. Red M&M's. Red M&M's. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Each one of our Hope of Mountain Storymakers books get a bookmark with tips for the family to use as they're sharing the book with their child. Um, and they're specific to the book itself, so it might have information. In this case, we're looking at Brown Bear Brown Bear. It might have more about animal habitats or the colors of the rainbow. What we're really fortunate to be able to do on occasion is offer native language translations. These are created by um, native language speakers in the communities where we work, so across Montana. And these have translations of the children's storybook on them. Um, so we're so fortunate to be able to be a part of making these available to um, children and their families across the state in rural and tribal communities. Maddie does such a wonderful job sharing her knowledge with others and local leaders are sharing their ways of working that are appropriate in their communities to foster positive children's development and healthy families at home. Oki, Oki is hello. One of the first things we do when we begin teaching or bringing children into the Cutswood School is you'll see the instructors here immediately. One of the first things they start doing is teaching animal names. Bonoka, elk, Mensinski, badger, Ganaskina, mouse. These are everyday animals that we see in our daily lives and it's a great way to start introducing the Blackfoot language to children. And this has been going on for, for years now, just using animals, using puppets in the classroom, and goes back to that idea, like my father said way back at, at the very beginning, there is no handbook on how to save your language, you just have to do it. And this is a good example of it right here. Darren Kipp's an extraordinary leader. He's the executive director of the Pigan Institute and the Cutswood School. He's carrying on the work of his father, Daryl Kipp, who founded this organization in encouraging the development and preservation of indigenous languages. In 1985, the community of Browning, Montana and the Blackfeet Indian Nation came together and did a, a community assessment, basically and wanted to know where the status of the Blackfoot language was on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. During that survey, it was revealed that the majority of the first language speakers were well over the age of 60. And so the reality set in that if no new speakers were created, the Blackfoot language here in our, within the Blackfeet Nation would be gone by 2010.
You do not have to have permission to speak your language. And you don't have to have permission to teach your language. You just have to do it. In our tradition, our real traditional way of life, it, we were kind of losing it. And especially like the, the words. A lot of people are losing their words today. And, and, and it's good that we have these young people today, children, that are being taught to uh, continue the language. But today, everybody has lost their language. They don't have, they can't say it's our first language anymore. They have to learn it today. And that's why it makes it very sad that we have to come to that part of our way of life. And so today I'm glad that we still have people that want to help us carry on and want to help our young people, or even our young adult that wants to learn our language, that they have a way for them to be part of it. You have to do that every day. It's just not something you do once in a while. At every meeting, anything, you, uh, we are told to speak the language, so I do that all the time. And we encourage our little ones, wherever they go, to speak to the people and in the communities. And we, um, They've been asked by several uh, programs to come and say their prayer and everything. So they've been encouraged highly. Their motivation and the way they feel about themselves is really high. You are listening to Koda Radio 91.1 FM, the voices from the Crow people. Ah, no abeli to. No abe chig. No abe by chim coli yaku loma. Co coi vahile lag akam. Away laid mahilat pashte dag de la. We have uh, seven different districts here on the reservation, and um, if I had a radio, I can just announce when we have uh, things going on. But also, to educate the community. So I kind of really want to uh, work with the youth, work with the uh, radio and also um, the elders in the community to have a voice and a voice of knowledge and a voice of wisdom. And also the young, their concerns. How can we improve the reservation? How can we get beyond poverty? How can we become become uh, part of um, the strength and part of the healing of the reservation. All the years I've been here, this is the driest I've seen the Little Bighorn River. Look at you're touching the bottom of that. Yeah. I think what's happening is up up a ways there. Wait till this is so the water used to be like higher? Yeah, we'll clear up to here. Uh, speak crow? Huh? Learning? I, I just speak crow. So Dora, say something and crow say. Bile uh -huh. itchik. 
The water is good. Bile itchik. Bile itchik. Uh huh. Duba, Dawia, Shoba, Shoho, Agawa, Sopwa, Dupaba, A greeting means um, itchim, itchik, the loam, a mewalachpage, a lage, itchik. Well, when I was young and their age, um, we weren't uh, allowed to speak Crow because of them saying that if we only spoke English, in the classroom will learn. Therefore, we, we weren't allowed to speak Crow. And we were punished for it. So that was carried on by probably their grandmothers who were went through it. And they're probably saying, you speak English first. So a lot of Crow was lost because of that. The boarding school era is a tragic chapter in our nation's history. Indigenous children were forcibly taken from their homes in many cases and sent to schools where they were punished for speaking their language, meaning generations of native children were removed from their homes, lost their attachment to their parents, their communities, and their native language. So the effort right now to bring indigenous languages back and rebuild communities with the leadership of local individuals like Peggy is especially important. Go to the map. No go, sing us at the peaks, mark, mark, it's in it's so and it's it's at the peoples and none. Hunt. Our Blackfoot language was under such pressure that we're now at the stage where, in order to save the language, we have to bring it in the classroom. The ultimate goal is to bring it back to the home because that's where the language will survive. And that's the dream. If we can bring it out of the classroom, get it back into the homes. And I see this younger generation, the kids that are in the school now, they have that desire. The kids that were part of the very first years of Cutswood School and the very first years of Moccasin Flat School, they all now are graduating from college. Many of them have their own children now and they're teaching it to their children. So it's happening. And it's happening slowly, but it is happening. You know, I'm standing in an area that I have a biological tie to that goes back thousands of years. In order to have that relationship with the land, everything around you, with your family, it's important to have your language. <laughs> Citizen leaders have an inherent sense, not only of what's happening now, but what could be. Working with them, investing in them, one of the greatest opportunities we all have because we can foster and support them and their change and also invest in the communities they work in. Because we're really talking about community leaders coming together, working together, and bringing all that social capital to create the kind of communities they want to see in the future. That's the power of this work.